Hey, I'm Dave. Welcome to my shop. I'm a retired Microsoft systems engineer going back to the MS-DOS and Windows 95 days. And I'm a guy who has spent more dawns than I care to remember staring at a command window while the internet refused to answer. And this morning was one of those mornings. So if your browser came up empty or your smart doorbell lost its smarts and your favorite games suddenly looked like retro server unavailable simulators, you met the guest of honor, a big messy AWS outage. One of the victims is apparently my teleprompter software, so just bear with me for today if you would. The outage started early Monday, October 20th, 2025, and for a few jittery hours reminded everybody that the cloud is still just somebody else's computer. Well, it's that plus a staggering amount of routing, caching, control planes, and failure modes that you really only learn about by bleeding a little bit. Today, we're gonna to reconstruct what happened, why US East 1 once again ended up in the crosshairs, why failover didn't look like the Hollywood dream cutover that you always imagine, and how wide the blast radius actually was, and what it tells us, uncomfortably clearly, about modern internet monoculture. Along the way, I'll translate the acronyms and pull some of the drywall off the architecture so that you can see the studs. Because I worked on the parts of Windows where, if you get it wrong, everything tips over, I'll give you my own take on why something as boring as DNS can become a singular spectacular point of failure. The first hints came in the dead of the night, West Coast time. AWS acknowledged increased air rates and latencies for multiple services in Northern Virginia, better known in the tech industry as US East 1. That's their oldest and biggest region, the one with the most gravity, the most legacy, and historically, the one where a lot of AWS's global control plane code paths have roots, stubs, or dependencies, even when marketing says global. Within minutes, apps that live and die by low latency calls to AWS services started going sideways. Think Snapchat, Signal, Roblox, Fortnite, and a grab bag of finance and commerce that made Monday morning feel very Sunday. Even Amazon's own Alexa and Ring were down, and by dawn, the reports numbered in the tens of thousands. And the list of down or degraded sites read like your phone's home screen. Let's talk blast radius in concrete terms, because the headlines were kind of all over the map. Reuters flagged Fortnite, Roblox, Snapchat, Coinbase, Robinhood, Venmo, and even Amazon's own Prime Video and Alexa in their impact set. It's a wild mix of real-time gaming backends, auth and wallet services, web sockets and mobile apps, and IoT control messages. Exactly the world where a couple of seconds might as well be never. The Guardian added that the PlayStation Network, Duolingo, and a laundry list of US banks and telcos were involved. AP's timeline pegs the onset around 3.11 a.m. Eastern with the first visible recovery by about 6 a.m. Amazon's own posts about it put the initial mitigation at 2.24 a.m. Pacific that acknowledges that some customers still experience increased air rates due to EC2 launch issues in U.S. East 1. Those numbers line up with what the operators felt. A sharp cliff, a ragged slope of recovery, and a frustrating layer of it looks like it's up but it's not quite warm yet. And it's that last mile, warming caches, repopulating connection pools, and rebalancing sharded traffic, which is why your app's uptime chart is more of a staircase instead of an elevator. So what went wrong under the hood? Well, AWS's status updates point to DNS, which is essentially the phone book of the internet. Specifically, resolving the DynamoDB API endpoint in US East 1. That sounds pretty niche until you realize that DynamoDB is a transaction engine behind an absurd number of login sessions, rate limiters, feature flags, game state stores, and ephemeral, we need three milliseconds of consistent NoSQL right now, use cases. And so what happens is that if you knock out name resolution for that API, even intermittently, the client SDKs will start to back off, retry, jitter, and then hammer again in exponential waves. Suddenly, the thing that was supposed to absorb elastic load becomes the source of it as every microservice in the dependency graph tries to rediscover where the database is hiding. Basically, the network becomes full of clients saying, where's Waldo? Sometimes all at once, but Waldo never answers. And that's how a DNS paper cut becomes a denial of service cell phone. AWS says the underlying DNS issue was fully mitigated at 2.24 a.m. Pacific with lingering trouble launching new EC2 instances as the fleet warmed back up and those caches unwound. If you still felt symptoms much past breakfast, you were probably caught in the long tail of stale DNS, cold capacity, and boot time dependencies. Different outlets framed the root cause with slightly different emphases. Emphases? Different outlets framed the root cause with slightly different angles. Some called out DNS broadly, others referenced issues with an internal subsystem that manages AWS traffic load balancers in the region. As is often the case, two things can be true. If the balancer control plane in US East 1 hiccups and the name resolution to a foundational managed service like DynamoDB simultaneously goes sideways, you get both ingress confusion and state store amnesia. 
and that's like a one-two punch to availability. The important part is that AWS and outside analysts agree that this was not a cyber attack. It was our old friend, a complex system plus a fragile link in a place that we didn't expect it to be fragile. The Reuters and AP tallies read like a festival lineup. Games, finance, tech, telecom, even government portals. In the UK, the Treasury Committee wanted to know why AWS isn't treated as a critical third party for finance. And when ATMs and mobile banking stutter, the people's patience gets short, and I don't blame them. And so to steal an old phrase, when Amazon sneezes, everybody else catches a cold. But it's not that AWS fell over globally. It's that enough core services that depended on US East One's fabric took a synchronous nap, and then the user experience was felt globally. The modern app is a Rube Goldberg machine of asynchronous calls that all complete in 100 milliseconds, until they don't. And now for the question that I can hear you shouting from your keyboard. Isn't the whole point of the cloud that it fails over? It is, and it does, within the boundaries that you engineer for. AWS gives you redundancy at three concentric circles. Within an availability zone, across multiple zones in a region, like across cities, and across multiple regions for things like continent-scale disaster recovery. And if you only spread across availability zones inside US East 1, you're resilient against that data center going dark, but not against a regional control plane or DNS failure. If your app's control plane, data stores, and identity tokens all have a hard dependency on a regional endpoint, and your clients refuse to talk to anything else because that's how you linked your SDK, then you can't hot swap to Oregon by hoping or by force of will. And that's because you didn't build an active-active multi-region system. You rented one region three different ways and called it a day. On paper, that's redundant, but in reality, it's a single region state with extra steps. Okay, Dave, but why doesn't AWS automatically reroute me to another region? Because me isn't an AWS console page. Me is your application's entire stateful world. There are solutions that exist, but they are opt-in architectures with cost, latency, and consistency trade-offs. You have to design the data model and the control plane to be region agnostic from day one. Otherwise, it's like you shipped a monogamous app and then expect it to be polyamorous during a crisis. If the auth tokens, if the auth tokens your mobile app mints are signed against keys stored in US East 1 only, and, or if your feature flags live in a table there, or if your rate limiter counters are strongly consistent in that one region, that even if you can cold start compute in US West 2, let's say, the very first API call that your brand new instances make is back across the continent to the dependency that's already flaked. And that's how we tried to fail over turns into we failed over and over and over again. The other subtlety is that AWS is really two interwoven universes. The customer data plane, which is your EC2s talking to your DynamoDB tables, and AWS's service control planes, the invisible machinery that provisions, scales, and routes the pieces. Historically, and AWS has worked to reduce this, some of those control planes had home field assumptions in US East 1. If you're building or running production systems and want to be the person whose slack stays oddly quiet on a day like today, here's the hard one playbook in plain language. First, model your dependencies like a network of lifelines, not a list of libraries. If the IDs for your users live in US East 1, decide today whether they must be globally unique and consistent within 10 milliseconds, or if you can tolerate per region consistency and reconcile it later. But pick one, because saying both is a lie that you tell yourself and your boss until an outage forces that decision to be made anyway. And second, treat your region as a config variable that can be changed in a crisis and that the apps actually accept without argument. And make sure that acceptance isn't conditioned on some certification chain that you know, hard codes a region in there for you that you didn't know about. So that means no compiled in endpoints and no secrets that only exist in one key management system. And third, make your clients smarter. When the SDK can't resolve a service endpoint, have it consult a signed config bucket in a different region to learn the alternates. The idea is that DNS being dumb shouldn't make your app dumber. Let it bootstrap from a second path. And finally, actually practice it. Chaos engineer your own manual Monday by turning off US East 1 once a quarter, do it in staging, and see what actually dies. So was this the biggest outage since CrowdStrike? Well, if it's you standing in an airport unable to check into your flight or get a boarding pass, then for you it certainly is. In terms of public awareness, it felt that way, but the mechanics are different. The CrowdStrike event was a defective kernel driver update that blue-screened the Windows hosts. The machines went down almost at a hardware level, and many didn't just come back on automatically when the smoke cleared. So recovery was a much more manual and involved process for that one. But in both cases, the theme is the same. When you centralize the wrong thing, you concentrate the blast. If that thing is code running at ring zero, everything blue-screens. 
If that thing is a resolution for a foundational managed service, then everything times out. Both are a reminder that resiliency you don't practice is the resiliency that you don't actually have. Pick a Monday, like I said, and start pulling cords until you find out how your systems really work. What's the outlook for a full restoration? Well, as of AWS's latest note, DNS was mitigated in the pre-dawn hours Pacific time, and the remaining issues tracked to launching fresh capacity in US East 1. Translation? Well, if your app needed to scale up during the incident, or auto-scaled down and is now trying to scale back up, you may still see air rates until the control plane finishes catching up. And that's the place where customers perceive that it's still down, while AWS says, but we've mitigated the root cause. Again, both are true from their own vantage points. Expect the long tail to burn off over the day as caches naturally expire, clients stop stampeding, and new instances get healthy. If your app still felt wobbly by midday, odds are good that you had a hard regional assumption somewhere in the control plane. Today just shined a flashlight on it. And as long as the impact for you has passed, it's also kind of neat when you think about it. The modern internet anymore isn't just something you can reboot or turn off and turn back on. It takes time to come back up, reestablish all of the internal linkages between services, and then stabilize. It's as much of an electronic organism as anything else I can think of, and like a deer, it can be a little wobbly when newborn. Let's zoom back out to the sociology. The Guardian's write-up quotes experts pointing out that we're at the mercy of too few providers, and they're not wrong. AWS, Microsoft, and Google run the digital grid the same way that a handful of utilities run the physical one in the last century. We used to spread risk at the network layer, now we concentrate it at the API endpoints. Regulators in the UK asked again whether a platform this central to their finance ought to be designated as critical infrastructure. As far as I'm concerned, when one team can knock over half the country's app logins by fat-fingering a root, well, what you've got there is called a monoculture. And the antidotes are mundane and unsexy. Diversity of providers, multi-cloud where it makes sense, and at least multi-region for anything that touches money, safety, or civic life. If you can't afford full active-active, you can still keep your control plane loosely coupled across regions so that the part that decides what to do stays online, even if the part that does it struggles. There's also a lesson for product managers who cut the checks. Multi-region is not just about data replication. It's about human replication. You're waking two on-call rotations instead of one, paying two cloud bills, and writing two runbooks. Most of the time, finance says no because the spreadsheet shows a three times cost increase for events that only happen every couple of years. And then you hit a day like this and your brand trends for the wrong reason and suddenly you learn the difference between CapEx and reputation. You don't have to go full Noah's Ark here, but pick a single user's journey, the one that lights off the CFO's eyes and make it approvably independent of any AWS single region. You'll be shocked how many, well, this must be in US East 1 assumptions you find hiding in those walls. And if you're curious why DNS is such a linchpin, as always, here's the quick tour. In a microservice world, most of what we call discovery is just ask DNS for the current answer on the IP. Managed services like DynamoDB and S3 give you a stable host name that resolves to a moving target. VIPs fronting load balancers, fronting fleets. Put more simply, DNS changes the actual IP addresses behind the scenes way more often than you might imagine. And when the database name fails to resolve or resolves to something that won't accept your TCP handshake, clients don't often degrade gracefully. They thrash. Good SDKs will try different address families, back off, and then rotate through resolvers. Great SDKs fall back to secondary regions if the service semantics allow for it. But the default path in a lot of stacks is retry here louder and often. Bueller. 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 Um, he's sick. At scale, that turns a sneeze into a stampede, and that's why AWS's update recommended flushing DNS caches. Think of it as like a million little pocket universes that all need to forget the wrong answer, and when they disagree, or until they don't, chaos will reign. Well, so yes, no, did US East 1 fail to fail over? Well, not exactly. It failed exactly the way it was allowed to, as a single regional failure with global consequences because so many customers tied their fate to a single region's name resolution and control plane. Redundancy was job one, but only within the region. If your app had multi-availability zone durability and spread traffic across three data centers in Northern Virginia, you met your SLA for the thing that you planned for. The thing you didn't plan for, what if the phone book for our favorite services glitches at 3 a.m., showed up for inspection. That's not AWS being naughty, that's you designing for the last outage and not the next one. And that's why you get the big bucks and I'm just on YouTube. As for how widespread things actually were and whether the internet was down, technically, don't let the adrenaline trick you. Core routing stayed up. 
PowerState on. Plenty of sites running in other clouds or wisely spread across regions kept on humming. Even X, according to Musk, didn't flinch. My own PDP still dutifully served their web pages to an interested world. What did happen is that a huge swath of apps whose critical paths hit US East 1 for auth, state, or payments wobbled in unison. To everyday users, that's indistinguishable from the internet is broken, which is why these incidents can feel a lot larger than their engineering footprint might otherwise indicate. If anything, that perception gap is the real risk, because when citizens lose trust in our digital commons, the next failure, whether it's malicious or mundane, lands a lot harder. Before we land this plane, let me put on my old Microsoft hat for one minute. Actually, I don't have any hats. Not handy, anyway. A lot of folks will dunk on AWS for having a bad day in its busiest region. And that's fair. It is their job. But the kinder reading is that high availability is a probability distribution and not a promise. The right takeaway is not cloud bad. It's assume every dependency fails and then make those failures boring. Today's incident will produce a surprisingly readable post-mortem in a couple of weeks, and some very smart people in Seattle and Herndon will tighten bolts that you and I will never see or worry about. But I'll be here to tell you about them, but only if you're subscribed. And since I'm mostly in this for the subs and likes, I'd be honored if you consider leaving one of each before you go today. Thanks for joining me out here in the shop today. See you next time. Because if the balancer control plane in US East won hiccups, <laughs> yeah, exactly. Do it, Glenn, do it, do it. <laughs>